In Minneapolis, doctors and public health officials battle a terrifying outbreak. The first victims are children, but then the epidemic expands. Now scientists must identify the contagion and track it to its source. Until the mystery is solved, no one is safe from the invisible threat. Some of the names in this program have been changed. On August 8, 1998, at 4 a.m., Marilyn Miller was awakened by her child's frightened cries. What's the matter, honey? Come here. Let's see. Oh my gosh, come on. Eight-year-old Billy was seized with terrible abdominal pain. He was burning with fever. Billy needed medical attention and fast. Okay, you'll be fine. This wasn't a normal childhood fever. Something was wrong. Billy was losing consciousness. The Millers rushed to a hospital in Minneapolis. By the time they reached the emergency room, the child was dangerously dehydrated. I need an ER stat. I need some normal saline with an IV setup. The pain spread throughout Billy's entire abdomen. When did this start? To Dr. Mitchum, the attending physician, appendicitis seemed unlikely. She immediately suspected food poisoning. And when was the last time he ate? I don't know, I guess last night he had um, chicken and some pasta vegetables. Is that what the rest of the family had all of No, we all had something different. Dr. Mitchum asked nurses to take blood and stool samples for analysis. We're going to need to admit him for observation for a few days. When we get the test results back this evening from the blood tests and the stool samples, we should have more of an idea of what's making him sick. Okay. We'll take care of you, fella. We need a bed, please. We'll take good care of you and get your bed in okay? In the lab, doctors found blood in Billy's stool. It indicated intestinal bleeding possibly from a foodborne bacteria. The stool samples were cultured in different sugar solutions and placed in an incubator. If bacteria were present, they would multiply within 24 hours. Until they had lab results, doctors could not treat Billy's symptoms aggressively. With some foodborne bacteria, antibiotics can cause life-threatening complications. Billy had been given anti-fever medication and IV fluids to fight the dehydration. Now all they could do was wait. Medic 21 dispatch, we're en route to Fairfield Memorial. The next morning, paramedics were called to a suburb of Minneapolis. Four-year-old Skylar Hartman was extremely sick. I think she's pretty dehydrated. I'm gonna go ahead and give her an IV. She had been vomiting for 12 hours and had severe diarrhea. All right, you're gonna feel a little needle poke. You ready? Okay, I know this is a trying time. Her fever had spiked to 104 degrees. Okay, what we got here? Four-year-old medicine. 
By the time Skylar reached the emergency room, her pulse was weak and her blood pressure was dropping. Doctors were concerned she was going into shock. If her blood pressure was not stabilized, her organs could shut down. Her symptoms were similar to Billy Miller's. Doctors ordered a stool sample and a complete blood workup. Okay, uh, when was the last time she ate? Last night. In the lab, Billy's test results were in. A chemical reaction had occurred, turning one of the solutions pink. This gave doctors their answer. They were dealing with Shigella, a dangerous foodborne bacteria. Shigella is a single-celled organism that attacks its victim's digestive system. The bacteria penetrates the cells of the intestines, causing inflammation and bleeding. The illness it inflicts is called shigellosis. Dr. Tim Namey is a medical epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta. Shigella itself can cause a very, very nasty infection. They will have severe diarrhea that may be bloody, they will have severe vomiting, often have high fevers and can become uh, quite dehydrated and quite, quite ill. And for people, especially who are either very young or quite old, they can have, um, can cause them substantial, substantial health problems. Without treatment, Shigella can migrate into the bloodstream, sending the body into shock. This can lead to organ failure. The next day, Billy's condition continued to deteriorate. Nurses monitored him for signs of shock. How are you feeling? Marilyn Miller, Billy's mother, was also feeling sick. Her symptoms were identical to her son's. The wrenching abdominal pain was a sign of shigellosis. Can we get some vitals on her nerves, please? Sure. I want to give you the phone number here. The Miller's illness seemed more than coincidence. <laughs> Dr. Mitchum feared she was seeing the beginning of an outbreak. And what might have caused the uh, food poisoning. Okay. okay. She put the Millers in touch with the Minnesota Department of Health. Epidemiologist Julie Wickland is an expert in foodborne bacterial illness. Julie needed to find out what Billy and his mother had eaten over the past four days. Just one second, I have to grab a foodborne illness form. Many times the public calls and thinks that they became sick due to a certain restaurant or a certain food, usually the last thing that they ate. But many times it can be days earlier that is really the cause of what made them sick. So there was a group of you? Several restaurants uh -huh. were listed in their food histories. Uh -huh. In Julie wondered if one of them was contaminated. Okay. Later that afternoon, Skylar Hartman was still burning with fever. When her stool samples were cultured, it confirmed doctors' suspicions Skyler was also infected with Shigella. For the second time in a matter of hours, okay. Julie Wickland so, was alerted. It was her job to determine if the two cases of illness were linked. 
When she took a four-day food history for Skylar, she made an important discovery. Three days earlier, both the Hartmans and the Millers had eaten at Angela's, a Minneapolis restaurant. Sounds good, thanks, bye-bye. That kind of ratchets things up a bit. It changes the intensity of our investigation. It's not just a passive situation, but now we're trying to do some active looking at what might be the cause of the connection between these people. If a local restaurant was contaminated with Shigella, they would have to work quickly. Dr. Craig Hedberg was supervisor of the Foodborne Diseases Unit. It can be a life-threatening condition, so it is a serious infectious disease that we're concerned about. Uh, it's also an organism that can be passed from person to person. Health officials mobilized. Their first stop was Angela's, the restaurant where the sick patients had eaten. They teamed up with the Minnesota Environmental Health Department, which is responsible for restaurant inspections and licensing. Hi, we're here from the health department. Investigators suspected the source of the illness was somewhere on the premises, but finding it would be difficult. Part of the investigation involves looking basically in every nook and cranny in the restaurant, trying to look at the kitchen, talking about food preparation, looking at sources of the food. Investigators check the temperature inside the freezers and refrigerators. The kitchen layout and preparation methods met safety standards. Shigella isn't found in the usual places, like contaminated chicken or meat. It is not carried by animals. Humans are the only significant carrier of this disease. Shigella can also live in water. Officials collected samples for testing. They gathered the restaurant's staff. Outbreaks of Shigella in restaurants are most commonly caused by improper hand washing by a food handler. When you see foodborne outbreaks related to Shigella, it's caused by food handlers or people who are preparing food who are sick themselves with Shigella. They have a little bit of it on their hands, and it gets into the food, and people get sick. Investigators conducted interviews with each of the restaurant's employees. Some of them reported being sick themselves, with symptoms consistent with shigellosis. Health officials gathered the reservation lists and credit card receipts for the week the patients had eaten there. The restaurant had served nearly 400 people that week. All of the patrons were at risk of contracting shigellosis. When an employee tested positive for Shigella, officials closed the restaurant's doors. Once we determined that there was illness among employees, we wanted to make sure that this restaurant would be closed so that there would not be further contamination. Now Julie had to find out how many diners were experiencing symptoms of shigellosis. It was a massive job, and she had to work fast. Shigella is an extremely infectious disease. It can be passed in a handshake, and it only takes a few of the bacteria to make someone ill. Julie brought in a team of students to help with the workload. Each interview can last for 10 or 15 minutes. So if you are interviewing 100 or 200 people by the time you make the phone calls and uh, get answering machines and, and actually get back to people, uh, it can take quite a bit of time. Simple yes or no, if that's what they answer. Just don't skip any questions. Are there people who are going to be around tonight for interviewing? Yeah, yeah I think we're all lucky. OK. OK, and then I have a list of the names of so the people who ate there during that week. They used a questionnaire to take a detailed record of the victim's symptoms and when they began. I'll go make some coffee. Health officials discovered that the illness was widespread, 
Out of 400 patrons, over half showed symptoms of sugallosis. The health department asked each of them to submit stool samples for testing. Several restaurant employees also tested positive for shigella. It supported the theory that an infected food handler was the source of the contamination. But when they analyzed the data further, health officials were surprised by what they found. Many of the patrons had become sick before the employees. The employees at Angela's weren't the cause of the outbreak after all. So then it made us think that it was not likely that the employees were the cause of the outbreak, but also victims of the outbreak. If it wasn't the employees, then it had to be a contaminated food item the restaurant had served. Angela's staff scoured the kitchen. They discarded all of the food. It is very chaotic. You are trying to work with the, the restaurant to prevent further cases. You're trying to make sure that the food handlers that work there are safe to go to work. You're trying to advise the public about what has happened, and you are trying to get to the source of the problem. Angela's would have to pass a health inspection before they could reopen. Infected employees could return to work, but only after they obtained proof of their recovery from a physician. As health officials searched for the source, four-year-old Skylar Hartman took a turn for the worse. The infection raged through her tiny body. The youngest victims of the outbreak were the most at risk of developing dangerous complications. Skylar was monitored for signs of hemolytic uremic syndrome, a life-threatening condition that can cause kidney failure. Another danger was that the bacteria could enter her bloodstream. If the infection became bloodborne, it could kill her. In August of 1998, Minnesota residents were attacked by a dangerous foodborne bacteria. Over 200 people became infected with shigellosis after eating in a Minneapolis restaurant. A week later, doctors and health officials faced a second Shigella outbreak in a suburb north of the city. Tara Parker, a 33-year-old teacher, had been sick for days. Now, she was delirious with fever and dangerously dehydrated. The lack of fluids caused her blood pressure to plummet. Paramedics rushed to stabilize her. Can you sit up a little bit, okay? Can you sit up a little bit? There you go. Take a nice deep breath. Tara, what, what were you doing today? You know where you are right now? Tara's symptoms were alarming. The abdominal cramps and severe diarrhea pointed to food poisoning. The Minnesota Health Department was notified immediately. The previous weekend, Tara had gone to dinner at an upscale restaurant called Baxter's. Two days later, she and her friends were violently ill. Baxter's became the second Minnesota restaurant linked to illness in one week. Identified. Thank you. Tara's stool samples tested positive for Shigella. The fact that these outbreaks had an onset and it was quite close in time, but spaced far apart, you know, geographically, was very unusual. That led us to wonder if there was 
something that was common to both the outbreaks. Can you come over here and talk to us? Yeah. Health officials tracked down the victims of the second outbreak. They took food histories and asked them to submit stool samples for testing. And are you experiencing any cramping? So we've been accompanying those cramps and it's gotten worse too. Okay. Each day, more victims of the outbreak called into the health department. The total number of cases in Minneapolis skyrocketed to over 300. At the Minnesota Department of Health, officials looked for a connection between the two outbreaks. They constructed a case control study, a public health tool that analyzes what the sick patrons had eaten in comparison to the healthy patrons. The results were puzzling. There were no food items that only sick patrons had eaten. The two restaurants shared no employees and there was no common water supply. Yet they still suspected the outbreaks were related. The lab would provide critical information. Bacteriologist Dave Boxrood and his staff zeroed in on the bacterial predator. They needed to compare Shigella samples taken from victims of both outbreaks. First, they extracted pure Shigella from the samples. The tiny rectangular plug contained concentrated Shigella DNA. All bacteria have DNA just like all humans do, and we can compare the patterns with the computer and we can tell whether things have identical or, or different fingerprints. The pure Shigella from each patient would be compared using a test called pulsed field gel electrophoresis, or PFGE. The PFGE test allows scientists to read and compare the DNA fingerprint of each Shigella sample. First, the gel plate is put in a water bath where an electric current is run through the samples. The current causes the DNA to break into pieces. Then it is placed in a chamber and read with an ultraviolet light. When the ultraviolet light passes through the Shigella DNA, it breaks into a distinct visual pattern. They discovered that the Shigella DNA from both outbreaks matched. This meant they were caused by the same contaminated source. Looks like we've got a lot of similarity between those five. Well, the moment when we found out that there were two restaurants in different parts of the state affected by the same extremely rare strain of an already unusual foodborne pathogen at the same time made us know the problem likely did not come from the local area and indeed probably came in on a food product that was shipped into Minnesota because even though Minnesota is a big agricultural state, most fresh produce comes from outside. And when you figure that out, you realize that probably a number of states have been affected by the same problem and that is really a profound realization. Public health officials in Minnesota had done everything they could to contain the outbreak. The two contaminated restaurants had been closed. But true to form, Shigella struck again. 60 miles away, 40 people became ill after attending a county fair. It looked like shigellosis. 16-year-old Kelly Davis was a high school student. She had gotten a part-time job at the fair to help save for college. Now, she was fighting for her life. 
Her symptoms were too familiar for coincidence. Severe abdominal pain, diarrhea, and dehydration. She also had an extremely high fever. Her severe dehydration caused her blood pressure to plummet. Doctors worried she wouldn't make it through the night. There were now three suspected outbreaks of shigellosis. The outbreak was spreading. Health officials were powerless to stop it. 25,000 people attend the fair each year. With so many visitors, a contaminant like Shigella could cause a massive epidemic. Investigators contacted each of the 40 victims to learn what they had eaten. They had all eaten different foods from vendors all over the fairgrounds. Each of the vendors had to be inspected for contamination. Every one of them met strict safety standards. Investigators were left with one frightening possibility. The Shigella could be in the fairgrounds water supply. If so, thousands of people were at risk of developing the dangerous illness. County health officials took water samples from several locations at the fairgrounds. They were sent to the Minnesota Department of Health laboratory. The water samples were incubated overnight. Under ultraviolet light, a cloudy luminescence would indicate the presence of bacteria. Health officials' fears were confirmed. The water at the fairgrounds was contaminated with Shigella, and it was the same strain that had attacked the restaurants. Health officials were stumped. How did the contaminated water supply relate to the restaurant outbreaks 60 miles away? Further investigation revealed that the fairgrounds underground pipes were bad. And to complicate matters, raw sewage was leaking into the water supply. It was a chilling discovery. What we believe happened in that case was that there were people who had become ill after eating at one of the restaurants who had been out at the county fairgrounds, probably while they were ill, um, had to use the, uh, the toilet facilities out there. And as a result of that, some of the water systems there became contaminated. A single source of bacteria had infected two restaurants and now the county fairgrounds. Thousands of people had been exposed to a virulent strain of Shigella. Minnesota was under attack and the source of the outbreak remained a mystery. In 1998, a dangerous foodborne bacteria called Shigella had infected hundreds of people in Minnesota. In Minneapolis, health workers were fighting a losing battle against the emerging epidemic. Elderly victims were hit hardest, their bodies too frail to fight the ravages of the disease. Seven-year-old Billy Miller one of the outbreak's first victims had been given a full course of antibiotics. 
but the infection still raged in his system four days later. For doctors, it was an ominous sign. It meant this strain of Shigella bacteria had developed a resistance to antibiotics. The parents of the sick children were terrified. If Shigella invades the bloodstream, it can cause shock and even death. Four-year-old Skylar Hartman was now in critical condition. Without effective antibiotics, she would have to fight the disease on her own. Officials at the Minnesota Department of Health issued a nationwide alert. DNA analysis revealed that all three Shigella outbreaks in Minnesota had come from the same contaminated source. It was an unusual strain for the area. That meant the bacteria had originated somewhere else. Scientists feared the cases in Minnesota were just the beginning of a much bigger problem. The standards are in lanes one, five, and 10. Bacteriologist Dave Boxrud emailed an image of the bacteria's DNA fingerprint to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. No, I think you should send it. In Atlanta, the CDC's Foodborne Illness Surveillance Team tried to determine how far the bacteria had spread. They posted data from the Minnesota outbreak on PulseNet a computerized database that tracks foodborne illness in the United States and Canada. The DNA fingerprint of the Shigella in Minnesota was entered into the database. It was compared to bacterial DNA collected in other outbreaks in North America. PulseNet is a very, very important communications tool. It allows sharing of patterns of bacteria that allow you to say if the Shigella that shows up in uh, Los Angeles is the same as the Shigella that showed up in Minneapolis. Scientists discovered that it was, and not just in California. There were outbreaks in Boston, Massachusetts, Marathon Key, Florida, and in Alberta and Ontario, Canada. In each case, restaurants were the source of the outbreak. How many other restaurants nationwide were unknowingly dishing out doses of Shigella? It's like a ticking time bomb. There, there's, there's still possibility for human illness and possibly death if the ultimate source of the problem is not addressed. A nationwide search was launched as the investigation in Minnesota continued. Health officials returned to the contaminated restaurants. There had to be a single food item, something the victims had all eaten. The roasted chicken. Investigators and chefs scrutinized the restaurant's menus. They broke each recipe down into a list of ingredients. We started to dissect the menu and dissect the individual food items to find out what they might have in common. And particularly with Shigella, we'd be looking for things that are raw type food items, things like chopped lettuce, tomatoes, or onions. What we did was ran the data analysis again. This time, one food item was highlighted. Most of the sick patrons had eaten dishes that used parsley as an ingredient or as a garnish. To investigators, it was an important clue. Parsley is a food item that often goes unnoticed. Parsley is what we sometimes refer to as a stealth food. In other words, it comes in a box, it is then subsequently maybe chopped up into small things and then is scattered about on a wide variety of dishes. The restaurants use parsley liberally, both as an ingredient and as a garnish. They had unknowingly served large doses of the toxic bacteria to their patrons. 
uh, the pieces really started to fall into place, that indeed we were dealing with a, a, not only a common bacteria that had been imported on a common vehicle, namely parsley, and that this parsley likely you know, came from outside of Minnesota, because no parsley is grown in Minnesota. The outbreak was now raging out of control. 486 cases of shigellosis were confirmed in four U.S. states and two Canadian provinces. Now investigators needed to find out how the parsley became contaminated. We say, okay, where did this parsley come from? How is it distributed? Contamination can be introduced at any step along the way. And our job is to find out with as great a likelihood and as great a certainty as we can where, that con you know, where the contamination was introduced and then ultimately to fix it. Public health officials worked with the Food and Drug Administration to trace the parsley back to its source. Starting at the infected restaurants, officials worked backwards. When you go to do a trace back of parsley, parsley doesn't come with a barcode. So often there's a lot of confusion in the restaurant, you know, which batch of parsley was that and where did that come from? They reviewed the receipts from each restaurant to learn where the parsley came from. A dozen different distributors had supplied parsley to restaurants in the area. Following up with the distributors would take time. And as each day passed, the tainted parsley would continue to poison more and more people. In August of 1998, an epidemic swept North America. Hundreds of people fell victim to highly toxic Shigella bacteria. Public health officials had traced the source to contaminated parsley. Now, they had to find out where the parsley was grown. Well, when there's an outbreak of foodborne illness or really any other type of outbreak, but particularly infectious disease outbreaks, the race is really on to get to the bottom of the problem, to solve the problem, to prevent disease that is either being transmitted actively or may be transmitted in the future. And it really becomes quite hectic and quite frenetic. The CDC launched a trace back. They relied on investigators from the Food and Drug Administration to trace the parsley from the consumer to the source. The global food supply is much, much more complex than it used to be. Uh, products are moving faster, they're coming from farther distances, they may be reprocessed, repackaged, and reshipped into other places, and it can be a heck of a, heck of a job to get that all figured out. Fresh produce is imported to the United States from all over the world. Parsley comes from South America, Europe, and the Middle East, as well as neighboring Mexico and Canada. FDA investigators used invoices to identify the parsley distributors that supplied the contaminated restaurants. From there, they learned which farms had grown the parsley. One of them, a farm in Mexico, had supplied six of the seven contaminated restaurants. A team of investigators rushed to Valle Verde, a large produce farm near Ensenada, 100 miles south of the California border. Officials from both the FDA and the CDC inspected the site. Valle Verde had 55 acres of parsley. They also grew tomatoes, celery, cilantro, green onions, radishes, and lettuce. Nearly all their produce was shipped to the U.S. Officials believe the answer to their mystery lay somewhere on this land. First, they inspected the farm's irrigation system. Tainted water is one of the most common causes of produce contamination. The farm's water came from wells sunk into an old riverbed. They used to irrigate, it's the same water that they drink. They were deep wells, so it was an unlikely source of contamination. 
team also investigated a reservoir on the farm's property. It's here, Dave. Can we remove an example? Yeah, he says. It looked clean, but officials collected samples. They would be shipped back to the United States for testing. It was now six months into the outbreak, and the source of the Shigella was still a mystery. These are the uh, irrigation towers right over here. Officials felt certain it had originated at the farm, but they had no scientific evidence to prove it. As the team traveled from site to site, they made an important observation. Farm workers were drinking expensive bottled water. Clearly, some felt that the local water was unsafe. Investigators wondered if the municipal water supply had ever come in contact with the parsley. You ready to go? Go. Go. At the farm's packaging and processing shed, the team learned that the parsley was harvested each morning and shipped out by 2 p.m. that same day. But before it was shipped, it was run through a large machine called a hydrocooler. The parsley was sprayed with chilled water to keep it fresh during transport and increase its shelf life. The hydrocooler pulled its water from the municipal water supply. The last step in the process could have contaminated tons of produce. Officials would soon learn whether or not their hypothesis was correct. In the summer of 1998, an epidemic of foodborne illness was traced to an unlikely source. Parsley served in restaurants across the United States and Canada had been contaminated with the toxic bacteria Shigella. 486 people reported illness. Hundreds more may have suffered in silence. U.S. health officials traced the parsley to a Mexican farm. They suspected local water was to blame. The officials investigated the municipal facility that supplied water to the farm. A manager admitted the facility's chlorinator had been disabled by vandals. It had been out of service for a month. Without chlorine, it was highly possible Shigella was flourishing in the town's drinking water. Negligence at the local level put not only the town at risk, but also the thousands of people who ate the farm's produce. Water samples from the farm were analyzed at the FDA laboratory in Washington, D.C. There, scientists ran tests to determine whether the unchlorinated town water contained the same strain of the Shigella bacteria that attacked victims throughout the U.S. and Canada. <laughs> 
testing revealed that the strains matched. FDA scientists alerted the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health. Finally, the six-month-long mystery was solved. For health officials, the Shigella outbreak served as a warning. At different times of the year, as much as 75% of fresh produce sold in the U.S. is shipped in from other countries. The Food and Drug Administration inspects only 2% for contamination. From a public health perspective, that is a frightening statistic. When you have food that is mass produced and then spread across the country and indeed across the globe, one problem in one plant or in one location can be rapidly amplified in time and space across the globe. Ensuring the safety of the food supply has become increasingly difficult in today's complex world economy. Finding and eliminating bacteria before it slips across borders is a global problem. In an era of evolving food economies and evolving uh, methods of food production, we need to ramp up our abilities in public health to be able to do investigations and studies and tracebacks that match the international and complex nature of these food distribution channels that we're now confronting. As officials develop new ways to confront these new challenges to public health, the threat remains. Given the fact that more fresh produce comes from other parts of the world, we may see Shigella become a more common foodborne pathogen. Those whose lives were touched by the 1998 outbreak know firsthand the debilitating effects of foodborne illness. It took Tara Parker literally months to recover. Younger patients regained their health more quickly. Skylar Hartman, once so close to death, made a full recovery. Hey, look at you. I got some good news for you. I like you're doing a lot better. Billy Miller was one of the first children to become ill. After weeks in the hospital, he regained his strength and could finally go home. Countless people affected by the Shigella outbreak did not report their symptoms. Officials suspect that nearly a thousand people may have been infected. Thanks to the dedication of doctors and public health officials, there was not a single fatality.